My name is Bob Morris. I'm a member of the Montana Tech Foundation Board of Directors and recently retired after 35 years in electric power and uh, after a five year stint in the oil and gas business. And so energy has been my, my career uh, for the better part of my life. I'm also a tech grad. I hold bachelor's degree, a bachelor's degree in geophysical engineering and a master's degree in engineering science. And uh, as you know, the world is amid uh, an unprecedented energy transition that's evident to us all. So if you drive a car or flip a light switch or tune into the news, you can feel the impact of this energy transition in our lives. Uh, where are we headed and what does this mean for Montana Tech? We, uh, we've assembled a panel of experts here to help answer some of these questions. And um, kind of the driver for this was about four years ago, uh, we had a, another panel, uh, Ryan Lance and Senator Daines were there. I think I see Joe McClafferty there, got that organized. It was a wonderful discussion about where we ha headed with energy policy. And since then, there's been a lot that's changed. And so it's really been, the change has been accelerated. And so I, I thought it'd be good to revisit that. So on our panel, I'll start from the far end of the stage there, is uh, Bill Glennon. Uh, Bill's a double E grad from Montana Tech, and he's presently the research and development director with Schweitzer Engineering Laboratories, uh, who's a world-renowned uh, company in power system protection and control. So, so they, they know power systems. And uh, Bill's also a graduate, I believe, of Billings Central High, if I got yeah. that right. Yeah. And uh, I think it was the outside linebacker at the Diggers? Middle linebacker. Middle linebacker, okay. Yeah. Um, anyway, so uh, well, uh, welcome, Bill. And then sitting next to Bill is Sky Callantine. Sky, like myself, is also a graduate of Montana Tech uh, in geophysical engineering. And Sky is the founder and uh, CEO of Validus Energy and based in in Denver. And so his background is obviously in the oil and gas industry. And then uh, joining, uh, joining us also next to Sky is Ryan Lance, who, Ryan, I think this is about the 10th yeah. presentation you've given. Yeah, we can just move on. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but Ryan's got a bachelor's degree in petroleum engineering and a Great Falls High graduate. And we're, we're excited to have Ryan here. And then uh, closest to me is doc, Dr. Robin Bullock. And Robin is the interim director for the Center for Environmental Remediation and Assessment here at Tech. And she's also an associate professor in environmental engineering. And she too is a Montana Tech graduate with bachelor's and master's degree in environmental engineering and a doctorate from the University of Alaska Fairbanks. And um, she's a high school graduate from Centerville, Ohio. So. Um, uh, the only non-Montanan on the campus, so uh, we're, we're welcome to have you today. Um, so what I want to do is I'll start off with a few remarks about the state of the energy industry, just to kind of set the stage, and then I'm going to ask a few questions of our panelists, and then uh, we've, uh, I want to hear questions from the audience as well. So we've saved time in, the, in our agenda today, and there'll be microphone runners to pick up your questions. So as many of you know, Montana Tech has a very strong tradition of producing engineers and scientists to harness natural resources to advance our society. Resources extracted from the earth have enabled modern living for the past 150 years. Recently, fossil fuel CO2 emissions are suspected of causing harmful climate change. Scientists with the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change the IPCC, have created models that predict irreversible harm to life on Earth if CO2 emissions continue and the Earth warms more than two degrees Celsius above our present temperatures. Governments around the world have issued mandates and subsidies to transition away from fossil fuel use. Presently, fossil fuels provide 80% of the world's energy for transportation, electric power, industrial, commercial, 
and residential applications. One such application is uh, fertilizer from natural gas. Uh, and the fertilizer from natural gas grows our crops. In the last 150 years, Earth's population has quadrupled from 2 billion to 8 billion people. And because of increases in farm production, largely due to fertilizer, we're now able to feed the planet with fewer farmers and fewer acres in production. So pretty amazing. So that's, you know, there's a lot of things that fossil fuels does besides uh, get us from point A to point B. Electric power in the United States is both affordable and reliable. Vertically integrated, regulated electric monopolies have built the largest machine on earth in the last, in the last 100, 125 years. In fact, one of the first generation and transmission systems that went in service was right here in Butte, Montana. So to, to power the lifts in the mines, the engineers harnessed the hydropower on the Missouri River in Great Falls and built a transmission system to send the power down here to Butte to run the mines. So it's no accident that when Montana Tech got its start 125 or so years ago, the two first degree programs were mining engineering and electrical engineering. Presently, 38% of our power comes from natural gas generation, 22% from coal, 19 from nuclear, and about 20% from renewables, including hydroelectric, wind, and solar. In the past 20 years, the U.S. electric power industry has reduced carbon emissions by half, simply by converting many of the coal-fired plants to natural gas. So natural gas is plentiful and it burns very clean. And it's what's basically keeping the lights on in our country. The forecast is to grow wind and solar generation by an order of magnitude in the next 20 or so years and to retire coal, nuclear, and natural gas generation. Wind and solar produce no carbon emissions, but are intermittent and require 10 times the construction material to build the turbines as conventional generation. So there's a big aspect in mining uh, on, on the renewable energy. In the next 25 years, light duty electric vehicles are forecast to increase from 5% to 30% of the, of the vehicle fleet. Electric vehicles reduce carbon emissions by only 15% compared to internal combustion engines. So if you look at when you plug your car into the grid, that's using coal and gas energy, which produces carbon. But then if you look further at all the mining that goes into to, to developing the batteries, there's a huge carbon imprint for that. So the latest report uh, suggests that it's only about a 15% savings in carbon emissions. However, the vehicles demand six times the materials as an internal combustion and, uh, engine. And many of these materials, such as cobalt, lithium, nickel, you've heard all these in the news, are, uh, have little domestic supply. So climate science will continue to evolve. Some scientists are predicting dire consequences if CO2 level emissions are not cur curbed. However, if you study paleoclimatology, you'll, you'll find that what it teaches us is that plant and animal life thrived on the earth with CO2 levels 10 times higher than present levels and temperatures 10 degrees C higher than present, present levels. The IPCC also teaches us in their 2015 report that 96% of carbon emissions come from Mother Nature. Turns out most of it is outgassing from the ocean and a good portion of it and then another part of it from land respiration. 96% from Mother Nature and about 4% from fossil fuel use. So just to put it in perspective. The, Green, the Greenpeace's scientist Patrick Moore recently published a paper, and he goes further, stating that present CO2 levels are dangerously low to support plant and animal life. So right now, our CO2 levels are about 400 parts per million, or 0.04%, and about 100 years ago, they were 0.02%. So the concern is they're going up, but Patrick Moore says 
They were dangerously low at 0.02 and probably too low at 0.04. And he argues that burning fossil fuels is complementary to plant and animal life. So there's another uh, side of the, the discussion. Stephen Coonan, uh, the chief si climate scientist for <clears throat> the uh, Obama administration, um, summed it up nicely. <clears throat> and he agrees that CO2 emissions have some impact on our climate. He says, but the effects are unknown. <clears throat> Present climate models, he maintains, are complex and inaccurate after a few years of projection. So if you, they're okay for the year or two in the future, but 10 and 20, uh, you can't trust them. He tells us to continue to use fossil fuels wisely and cleanly. He promotes continued climate science investigation. But regardless of Stephen Conan's advice, we're in the middle of a rapid energy transition. Many governments have set net zero or zero carbon goals to be reached in the next few decades. And these impacts will, uh, these changes will impact our standard of living, our national security, our economy, and our, and our environment. So the stakes are huge. So I ask, what is the future of energy? So with that introduction, what I'd like to do is uh, ask our panel a few questions. And, and Ryan, I'm going to pick on you first, okay, sir. And my question to you is pretty high level. It says, how do we provide secure, sustainable, affordable energy in the future? And what role will fossil fuels play? Well, yeah, thank you, Bob. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you all for uh, being here today. I think these are important conversations to be having. Certainly, we're having them in the world. We're having them in the United States and certainly having them within our company in the energy business and, and the company that I run today. I would say that um, people, I think, recognize they, they don't particularly want to say it, but the I think the reality of the situation is all forms of energy are going to be required to power the world forward over the next few years. If you're worried about the advancement of the human condition, there's nothing more important than affordable and reliable energy. So today there's 1.4 billion people that have what you and I have, which is lights that come on, heat that heats a home, and air conditioning that will cool your home. And there are four groups of 1.4 billion people who don't have that today. So it's China, it's India, it's Southeast Asia, it's Africa. So the biggest thing we can do is try to get affordable and reliable energy so that population today that Bob said is about 8 billion people, but is projected to grow by 2 billion more people over the next 20 to 30 years. So having access to affordable and reliable energy is issue number one. And I would say it's really going to take all the above. It's really going to take uh, where, where the wind blows. It's going to take you know wind energy. It's going to take solar energy. It's going to take nuclear. we got to figure out how to make coal cleaner. And it's going to take fossil fuels like oil and gas as well and probably some nature-based solutions as well. So the planet is warming. We can argue whether that is good or bad. <clears throat> but the problem is we don't want to go through this grand experiment on our planet, wake up 50 years and say, oh, we guessed wrong 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. So we should be doing those things to make all the forms of energy more sustainable. And every form of energy has an impact. You know, we talked about the impacts that wind and solar have. Our business in oil and gas, the business that I'm in today, does have three things that we need to take care of. We got to eliminate methane emissions. We can't have leaky facilities. We got to eliminate flaring around the world. There's a plenty. Of, there's a lot of gas and there's a lot of oil. People are producing the oil and they're just flaring the gas into the atmosphere because they have nowhere to put it. At the end of the day, industry's got to figure out that, and we've got to figure out a fix for our orphaned wells, wells that were drilled 50, 60, 70 years ago, and they weren't properly abandoned, and they're leaking a little bit. So our industry has three things that we need to work to make our business more sustainable. But under all the projections that you see, whether you believe in a degree to half or whatever, fossil fuels still represent probably somewhere around 50% of the energy mix going forward. And the reality is when we can get policymakers talking that it's going to take all the above and that everything is going to be needed to power the world going forward, then we can actually get into rational conversations about policies that are needed to make it more sustainable. What, how do you deal with the impacts of wind? You know, today, blades are indestructible and non-biodegradable. What do we do about that? You know, solar takes up a big, huge footprint. How are we going to deal with that? 
already articulated the issues with oil and gas. Nuclear, how do we make it safe? How do we deal with the, the waste? And how do we deal with the pro proliferation that could be possible to countries that could get nuclear power? So there's impacts for all this kind of stuff. And until we recognize that it's going to take all that above in order to power the whole world's energy needs, then we can get into rational <coughs> conversations about balanced policy around each one of those elements. Excellent. Thank you, Ryan. And so, uh, Sky, the next question will go to you. So how is the petroleum industry responding to the government mandates and stimulus to remove, to reduce carbon emissions? Sure. Thanks, Bob. Um, it's a very big topic. Ryan and I probably have different perspectives just in the size of companies that, that we do um, work at. I, I would say that um, we primarily do work on private lands, you know, just because of the added complication of, of dealing in government lands. But that, that process has been um, in existence for, for a very long time. I would say that, you know, there's a lot of talk in the media about of big changes that, um, that the government is making. And I don't know if that's me or somebody else. But, um, and, uh, and I think the reality, at least from, from our standpoint, is the, we really don't see a ton of new regulations. I would say some of the actually happen from capital markets um, mm -hmm. through, the, through the private side. Um, now, obviously, there is, a, a, and I agree with Ryan that on the three things that we need to work on. I think some of the regulations around um, venting and, and flaring onshore U.S. Are, are, are probably a good thing, you know, even though that does cost uh, additional money. What it does is companies like Ryan's size that are probably already working on that, some of these regulations on a lot of companies our size, which is a lot of the industry that, that people don't know about, um, you know, it kind of brings a more uh, reasonable standard for everybody. And, and I think there, so there are some positives that come from it. Um, I do think that there's a, most of the discussion about new regulation um, are really designed for, uh, to limit supply. And, and, you know, I agree with Ryan that that's, it's very short-sighted. You know, I think it's, um, you know, you're not really accomplishing anything by, uh, by limiting supply. You know, you need to, we need to work on demand if we're going to, do anything, and um, and so additional regulations taking large swaths of of uh, of the U.S. Or, or even the world, and saying you know there's going to be no development here. You know, I, I think that you know outside the national parks and and some of the systems that we already have, you know, I, I don't think that's a long-term beneficial solution. Um, uh, so you know, in in short, um, it's it's a very complicated set of federal, state, local regulations, but. Um, but, but I don't think a lot of the things you see and a lot of things you hear, um, really with the exception of pipeline and transportation, um, that, that we see a lot of it in our business. But I, I, Ryan should probably add to that because I think he's got a different perspective. We do it as clean as anybody in the world mm -hmm. in, in the production that we have. And it's largely the, uh, the publics and the privates that Sky's talking about. You know, if you really want to have an impact, you got to change behavior. you got to change your behavior. You know, if you want to drive EV cars, you know, we, you know, you've got to have a carbon tax. You have to have something that changes the drive and the demand for the product. Because as the demand is there, we're going to figure out how to meet that demand with the supply. And attacking the supply side just defers the production. That means it's going to come from Nigeria, Iran, Iraq, the Middle East. And, it's not, and, they, and we know they don't have the same systems and processes and controls that we have in the United States. And it's going to be dirtier energy at the end of the day. So I think uh, just by attacking the U.S. system as a is again, that's a flawed policy approach to solving a problem. Just don't attack the supply side. You got to come up with a reasonable, you got to attack the demand side as well, to your point, Sky. Great. Thank you, Sky and, and Ryan. Uh, Bill, the next question's for you. So, what's happening on our electric power grid as we transition away from fossil fuels? Yeah, great question. And thanks, uh, everyone, for joining us. Thanks for having me up here. Uh, so, the electric power grid, you talked about the, in the, the building up of renewable sources in the form of wind and solar. So, uh, you know, over the last couple of decades, we've seen a number of coal facilities retired and uh, a, a huge influx of wind and solar uh, sources, which are intermittent, meaning that, the, you know, the sun doesn't shine. They're not producing power when the wind's not blowing. They're not producing power. And in the electric power energy industry, we, we deliver energy at the speed of light. So when you flip a switch, an electric generator produces more power to meet that demand. So when you have intermittent sources that are coming and going off the grid, it, it presents challenges to system operators to meet the demand 
and the diversity of load across the whole system. And so when we look at, uh, Bob, you mentioned that the offset that uh, uh, coal power that's been retired, it's largely been natural gas, although there's been huge investments in wind, wind and solar. And as a result, the electric power industry right now, we're in a spot where some system operators are operating with a reserve of about 3%. So when their peak load for their system, they might have about 3% of extra generating capacity, which for us, historically, systems were designed to have about 20% uh, generating capacity above their peak loads. So that in the event a generator is lost, they can maintain system reliability and avoid power outages or widespread blackouts. What happens when that reserve gets really low is like in 2020 in California, uh, they had rolling blackouts and there's been... Uh, uh, potential for rolling blackouts in California about every summer when their peak load hits uh, uh, cooling homes. And so uh, at the same time, for about 100 years, we saw the cost of electric power come down. And, and it was remarkable because the original uh, uh, roots of the electric power system strove to make electric power affordable and reliable for all to benefit from it. And we've seen when communities get electric power, the great benefits it has. And for the last two decades or so, the trend has going up in the cost of electric power. So it, on average across the country, it's somewhere in around 13, 14, 15 cents per kilowatt hour. In California today, uh, they're paying around 30 some cents per kilowatt hour. We see in countries like Germany where they've gone all in on uh, intermittent sources and at the expense of retiring uh, things like coal or, or moving away from nuclear, what happens is they can't meet the demand of their system. Costs and reliability start to go hand in glove and your costs skyrocket. So in Germany, they're paying maybe four times the price for electric power. And, and it creates a lot of uh, challenges for the designers and operators of the power system to continue to provide reliable power. And, and the, the impact of higher costs is really to those who have the least amongst us, right? When you can't afford to pay your electric power bill and your, your rates are skyrocketing, when you can't, uh, uh, when when electric power uh, becomes out of reach for you to have some convenience uh, within your home. So, and then uh, globally, I think electric power. I think about half of the world lives in electrical poverty, right? So about half of the world is living on a less electric energy than the annual uh, cost for your refrigerator, the annual energy consumption of a refrigerator. And so you think about uh, bringing electric power to these parts of the world that are living in an energy deficit in the, just the brain power uh, that we could unleash by giving those people a, a, a better medical care, better uh, access to education and freeing them from you know, the labor and uh, the living conditions that they, they may have today. And, and um, we have great potential to solve these problems. So I think uh, one of the things in the electric power industry we think about when we're um, putting our thumb on the scale for one source at the expense of rapid moving away from something like coal through policy, the fear is that we can't mean reliability and affordability of electric power. Um, so I 100% I agree that it's a, it's a, it's a sum of everything approach that will get us in the future. The, the attractiveness of wind and solar are there because everywhere the lights, the sun shines, right? And there's a lot of energy we can harvest from that solar power. And, and wind power when the wind's blowing, but we need to do it in a way that we maintain affordable electric power and reliable electric power to benefit uh, the communities that our, our industries serve. Yeah. Oh, ec excellent, Bill, thank you, thank you so much. So Robin, we're gonna turn the next question to you. So uh, I've learned that you're working to create a new energy and environmental innovation campus at Montana Tech. Can you tell us more about your vision for that, that, that project? Sure. Um, when I think about Montana Tech and, and what we're looking at for uh, the campus, I really think of it in a couple different um, columns. You have integration, you have innovation, um, you have scientific rigor, and you have collaboration. I think a lot of these things that we're talking about are whether or not we've got a scientific basis for the decisions that we make. So having tech be that um, unbiased scientific um, entity 
is a really good thing. Being able to drive innovation from bench scale to field scale is one of the concepts that we have. How can we make it so that we can create and energize, I guess energy, energize, um, our community to do things in a, in a big way so that we can actually make forward progress from our bench scale and our lab scale where we're doing great research, but how can we um, get that into industry's hands and community's hands that much quicker? Integration being um, each of these individuals have succeeded because they were able to reach out and diversify their interests associated with it. They didn't do anything by themselves and neither do we. So the more that we can have an interdisciplinary, and I'm looking at the students, um, mix to how you approach problems and how you can um, feed off of each other and so to speak, reach across the aisle, the better, um, research, the better solutions we will have. And really that collaboration, we just recently, and I, I see some individuals from MR and Bitsa Rabo here in the audience, we just recently put in a proposal to um, install solar at Montana Resources, Bitsa Rabo and Montana Tech, so that we can start having an um, integrated energy mix here on campus so our students can see, yes, you can do geothermal. Yes, you can do solar. Yes, you can do wind. Yes, you need oil and gas. Yes, we want to think about nuclear. All of these elements are part of how we're able to move forward. And you all need to understand the entire energy mix and the pros and cons associated with each of them and generate solutions so that we can have um, a prosperous and, and be able to take you forward within this. So we're really hoping for a much more hands-on field uh, station so that you can have those opportunities so that once you exit here and you are come back in 30 to 50 years like the rest of us um, and have these conversations that you're that much further along in, uh, in the progress. Great. Robin, thank you so much. And what I heard now three times on, from the panelists was a, uh, the need for an all of the above solution for energy uh, uh, sources, and so I think that's neat that the, the that's part of the vision of the of the energy campus. Um, could you expand maybe a little bit about the partnerships you might uh, have with uh, industry or, or government on that project? That's a critical component. Um, again, you can't do anything by your yourself, and certainly an academic institution cannot succeed um, alone. You need students, you need government support, you need industry support. We want to ensure that the students have real world application associated with their research and their projects. Mm -hmm. So the more industry and government collaboration and community collaboration we can have, the more success and opportunities you're going to be able to have. And so we are certainly open to all of the above, whether it's you're looking at uh, critical minerals and rare earths. You're looking at oil and gas and potential lithium production associated with that. Mm -hmm. You're looking at the increase in geothermal and solar. However we want to approach this, we want to ensure that we're reaching out to those uh, respected entities and having those discussions about how we can uh, bring those solutions and those innovations into uh, application. Great. Thank, thank you so much, Robin. And uh, Bill, back to you. One question that I get a lot is, what impact does electrical vehicle charging have on the electric grid? Yeah, that's a great question. It's obviously a very hot topic. Uh, so the electric vehicles, um, for me uh, personally, I think it's going to be a, an exciting and lots of fun because there are no shortage of challenges to the electric vehicle uh, question. So so for example, recently we sat down with Exelon, a major US utility, and, the, and they own Comet in the Chicago area. And they talked about the peak load that they had ever hit uh, was just short of 24,000 megawatts. And the policymakers uh, uh, in their area that are shooting for projections of EVs, uh, they, their models say that they have to get to 50,000 megawatts of generation by 2050. So in the next uh, 30 years or so, they have to more than double their generation capacity if they were to meet the suggestions coming from the policymakers in their area. So uh, is that doable? Uh, uh, 
probably not at that level, but certainly it's going to create lots of interesting challenges for the electric power industry. If you think of the transformer uh, hanging on the power pole and the conductors going to power your home, that transformer was sized for that, the size of the home or the facility that it supports or the, the, the city block that it supports. And if now you have mobile loads moving throughout your community, coming in and out of the electric power grid and needing to consume power, all the conductor sizing, all the transformer sizing uh, needs to be revisited. Um, when you have mobile loads of electric power uh, and, and uh, the distribution system complexity uh, becomes huge, right? And so how we control and protect the power system, there's lots of challenges. How we meet the demand um, for not just EVs, but even data center load growth is, uh, is pretty significant in some parts of the countries to, to power data centers, for example. And so now back to the all-in-one approach, I think there's some exciting opportunities for our industry ahead, both with the natural gas, small nuclear reactors, um, and then the infrastructure that's needed uh, uh, to do many of the rooftop solar projects mm -hmm. and, and address the, uh, the power system was, was originally designed to have large generation facilities that transmit power over a transmission network and distribute it throughout the community. And now you're seeing uh, uh, the transmission uh, system and the distribution system become more of a network where you have distributed energy resources on the distribution system. So instead of a one-way street, right now we have two lanes or a one-way this time of day and a one-way this way at the other time of day. And so when it comes to controlling uh, and protecting the electric power system and keeping it reliable and safe and affordable, uh, there's a lot of opportunities uh, uh, for the industries, those designing the power system, and there's a lot of challenges ahead of us. So it's an exciting time to be part of the industry. Thank you, Bill. Yeah, it is. It's a great, great time to be an engineer. So, uh, Sky, back to you. What opportunities do you see for Montana Tech graduates in our energy transition? Yeah, I think uh, what what Bill said is is very true amongst um, you know probably every engineering discipline uh, we have here. I think that the all the above approach the um, you know additional capital into maybe areas that you know traditionally hasn't had that capital you know through through uh, government initiatives is going to create the opportunity to study to build and um, and really this university is designed to have the entire value chain of the entire energy system so whether you're in uh, geoscience and the exploration or um, you know if you're in petroleum or mining you know some of the extraction there's mm -hmm. you know all the mechanical and electrical and and um, things that go along with building equipment um, and the design, you know the, the 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 safety people alongside all those people that need to go work, um, the environmental, you know, once um, you uh, you know you have to create all this stuff needs to be sustainable, um, you know, as you move through time. And so I think the opportunity is 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 both deep and wide. Um, and you know, and on top of that, just supply and demand. I think the STEM education system in the country is you know continuing to to shrink. And as demands go in the opposite direction, so I think that's you know probably a net negative for the country, but a, definitely a net benefit for the students here. But, um, you know, uh, one of the, my favorite quotes is that it, it doesn't matter what the question is; the answer is money. And so, you know, why would you want to be there? You're just going to get paid really, really well because there's not very many of you. And and to me, I, I think that would be an exciting time if I were in your position. So, um, yeah, I can't I can't think of any degree program here that has a negative outlook over the next five, 10, and 20 years. Great, thank you, Sky, and, and Ryan, back to you. So everyone knows of your significant contribution to the campus, and thank you again, but what, what could you share with us your vision for Montana Tech's role in, in the world's energy transition? Well, I probably can't say anything better than what Sky did. I think uh, y'all are in the catbird seat, right, right in the middle of it, and there's just a ton of opportunity when you combine what Bill was talking about in, in Sky, just think of all the infrastructure that we have to build in the United States in order to satisfy the growing ener energy concerns. And when you extrapolate that to the world, you know it's it's going to be significant. It's 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 high speed, high voltage, right direct current and alternating current uh, transmission lines. It's a lot more oil and gas. It's going to be you know pipelines that can handle take natural gas and maybe convertible to hydrogen 
over time. And you think about the infrastructure that we've got to build, you know, it's back to what it looked like in the 50s and the 60s coming mm -hmm. out of the World War II for this country. And so we've got a lot of work to go do. And then the, the permitting side and the environmental side is we can't do that and we can't, you know, we can't impact the planet at the same time. So we have to do it in a sustainable fashion. So I think, to Sky's point, all those disciplines come together and uh, to Robin's point, in a very collaborative sort of way, we all got to work that together to try to figure out how to make it as sustainable and as perpetuating as we, as we can over time. And, and I think Montana Tech is just right in the juxtaposition of all of that and, uh, and, and great opportunity for the, the kids that come out of this school to play a huge role in what of this evolution is going to look like on the energy side. Great. Thank you, Ryan. So now I'd like to open it up for questions from the audience. I think we've got a couple of microphones we can run. So if you could raise your hand and we'll get a microphone to you so that everyone can share your question. There's a question over there. It looks, Dr. Trudnowski, I think is the, the first one. <laughs> my first question actually is for you ryan um and it's a hard it's I, it's probably a really hard one but your perspective will be really good for us right you you said having reasonable conversations and a lot of the conversations have to occur at the federal level and in today's political climate that just it's hard to see that happening What's your perspective on, how, especially from a, a young person coming out of college, what's your perspective on how to have that conversation? I think you, you get, well, get, get involved politically. So don't, uh, don't abdicate that responsibility because it's everybody's responsibility to get involved. And I would tell you what, what, what bothers me about the, the politics sort of in Washington, D.C. and the national, maybe some of the global politics, around this particular issue is it's the fringe that's trying to drive the middle. So we need to get rid of the left, far left and the far right and, and go down the center. And I think that's when you have responsible conversations about that. And I, I would hold your representatives and your senators, I'd hold their feet to the fire on this issue and say, what do you think about this? How are you gonna solve this global issue and how is the United States gonna play in that role? And you gotta get involved uh, politically. I was, uh, I was with uh, the guys at, at lunchtime. I, can you, what did Bob, was it you, Bob, that said, what's the, what's the three line? Uh, oh, yeah. So, I thought, this, so, uh, so this I thought was pretty compelling. And I think yeah, so the energy pretty... transition is a mix of physics and economics and politics. And so, as you know, you can't cheat the rules of physics for an instant. And you can only cheat the rules of economics for a short time. And in politics, there are no rules. <laughs> so I think you got to get involved and, and you got, we got to create those rules. And we gotta we gotta get our representatives uh, speaking on our part, speaking down the middle, and not you know not being too influenced by the the fringes on both the left and the right. There are real consequences. You know, you think of the other federal government education and some of these things that are nebulous, and you kind of get to pick and choose how you measure things, and you get to say you're you're having success when you're not having success. Um, you know, I think we've seen it recently with the volatility in commodity prices. You know, I think it's it's amazing to me how few people look at their heating and cooling and electricity bills. But, you know, as, as these things start to move their way through the economy, there, there, there will be a reckoning and it is measurable. And um, in kind of the, the populist mood in this country, um, you know, it's, it's going to have real consequences and it's going to come to the forefront. And you just can't hide from physics, uh, was what you mentioned. And you can, you know, we all see there's two people talking about the same number <laughs> and they, get, they have a 180 degree view. You just can't have that when, when your gasoline prices are six bucks. I mean, it's six bucks. Bill, can you comment? Uh, Bill, can you comment on uh, battery or energy storage and how that's impacting the grid and everything? Yeah. Okay. So batteries and energy storage. So that is uh, batteries uh, or energy storage, maybe in the form of like a pumped hydro, right? Pumped hydro. There's been a number of projects around the world where, when the wind is blowing or the sun's shining, and they have excess capacity from the demand at that time, they use a battery. Uh, to store that energy or pump hydro up a hill. And then when the wind and solar uh, is unavailable and the, 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 there's demand from the load side, you let the water come down and you essentially turn it into a generator or you discharge the battery. 
Um, so there's been a lot of uh, uh, interesting uh, uh, ideas of how we can use batteries, we can use uh, pumped hydro or other forms of energy storage to uh, capture the excess capacity we have at times when there's a, a high availability of wind and solar. So for example, a couple of weeks ago, uh, Texas had to curtail uh, wind generation. They have excess wind generation above the level of demand. So they actually uh, had to shut down some generators or couldn't consume that power because there was no demand for it. Um, so the one thing with battery technology is um, uh, battery technology uh, has been advancing over the last few decades. But over the histories of battery technology, the energy density storage has really not significantly changed. Mm -hmm. So to, for large scale batteries to contribute significantly to electric power grid, you would need a really big batteries, a really a lot of land or a ton of them. So there is uh, some talk that, or thought process that you know you could you could charge your EVs, for example, with uh, uh, solar power or uh, wind power when it's available and in excess, and then contribute it back to the grid at other times. Um, the the actual electrical infrastructure and control systems that would require to uh, make that available and happen at a large scale is is quite a long ways off. Mm -hmm. um, so so there is some interesting projects. I know there's a number of projects. Uh, uh, our companies help support a few projects here and there with battery storage. Um, it's also a, a very interesting environmental channel challenge with batteries because there's there's so many chemicals and uh, minerals in those batteries. What do you do with them uh, after they're, they've reached the end of their useful life? And, and now what do we do with those and what is the impact of those on our environment? So, uh, yeah. I may add, add to Bill's comments. So the, if you look at the economics of the battery storage, um, and I shared this with uh, at lunch today, you, you put a, a dollar's worth of electricity into a battery, and it takes you six dollars to get it back out. If you factor in the cost of the battery and the life cycle, you know, that, that's where it's at. So it's, it, it's a very expensive way to store energy. And the batteries that are presently being put on, you know, the utility scale batteries, are the same lithium ion technology that's used in automobiles. And it was designed for an automobile to be lightweight and to quickly discharge. And that's not what you want on the electric power grid. So there's actually some work being done on some other battery technologies that may be better, but the, the bottom line is the battery storage is never going to be any significant uh, storage capacity. You know, it's going to be in the sub single uh, sub percentage of the of the amount of energy you need to store. Last week during our 50th anniversary of environmental engineering, we had a bunch of conversations about local problems and that how, how that motivated Montana Tech to be innovative, to create one of the first environmental engineering programs. Um, what strikes me as I listen to this conversation is that this is very much a global problem and that I think creates a different mindset in how you think about it, how you motivate others. And so I was hoping you could maybe comment on how the scale and the proximity of the problem helps you or influences your thinking on how to solve this challenge. <laughs> um, so I do think we've shifted from local application to global application. When we think about um, whether it's critical minerals and how the supply chain might look in the US, we have very limited resources here versus China and Africa um, have the majority of those resources and those assets. So when we think about supply chains and being able to ramp up technologies, we have to think on a much broader basis than just what is locally available. And that's something that from a technology basis, I'm not certain is being totally factored into um, our near-term decisions because um, rapid technology deployment um, makes it that much more difficult when you don't have some of those natural resources available. One of the things that used to be nice was if you have all of these different natural resources, you have wood you, that you can burn, you have coal that you can burn, you have solar that you can generate, you have wind that you can do, and you are able to derive and utilize the best available technologies for the location you're at. 
we're headed into a different um, era where we may not have some of those natural resources um, locally available, and we'll have to figure out how to obtain them in the near term in order to achieve some of those um, uh, technological applications or find new materials in order to um, be able to be successful into the future. Not, I'd add maybe one um, to that. So. So Bob talked about the IPCC report. So that's the globally generated, you know, inner country uh, work on climate change. Embedded in that are what are called NDCs, nationally determined commitments. So every country has got a commitment via the Paris Agreement to try to reduce emissions by 2050, semi-arbitrary point in time. They just pick mid-century. The, the problem with the solution to this global problem, it's not a country by country problem, it's an industry by industry problem. So in other words, what's gonna help the oil and gas business reduce our emissions footprint is different than what airlines need. It's different than what power generators can do. It's different than what a cement manufacturer can do or a steel manufacturer. So until we can convert in a global problem these nationally determined commitments that is U.S., Canada, uh, Europe, uh, China, you know, all these country by country approach to it. You've got to get, instead of verticals, you got to go horizontal. You got to figure out the solution to the airline industry is not going to work for uh, the automobile industry. It's not going to work for cement. It's not going to work for steel manufacturers. So until we can kind of convert the whole system into a, you know, uh, horizontals, to talk industry by industry, because the solution is going to be a lot different. Hydrogen could be a solution for steel or cement. What does that mean? Or what are the policies that would enable hydrogen production to fuel those energy intensive industries? How about biofuels and other forms? You know, how many want to fly on an electric plane? I'm not sure I do anytime soon, right? So it's going to be a different solution probably for the airline industry rather than the light duty vehicles. You know, heavy duty truckers just go to the truck stop station outside of Butte here and, you know, see what challenges they have in trying to electrify that fleet. So again, it, when we can move a global, fix a global solution, it's got to be kind of an industry by industry approach to be effective, I think. I would, I would take your question in a different way, just like super local. I think one of the issues now is there's a lot of discussion on the global, right? We're small people trying to solve global problems. I think as, as a, lot of, a lot of the energy things start to be you know, make its way through communities where you do have to make trade-offs, people learn more about it. I can tell you, I've learned more about it. I'm um, on the board of a country club. We're building a new clubhouse. Let's do solar. You know, we had to put pencil to paper. We knew what the cost was. We knew, um, you know, what the effect was. And I don't think anybody on that board really knew what the math was until we went and did it. Um, I, I bought an electric car. Um, you know, I figured that you could just go buy one. Well, you can't just go buy one. Um, and so when, when you look at some of these things and you actually get some personal experience on the community board, you know, you have a, you have a limited budget and you have to um, make trade-offs and allocate, you know, where am I going to spend this money? Um, and I think as we start seeing that go through the community, I think some of these pie in the sky things that the federal government, the federal government has infinite money. Um, they throw trillions of dollars at things that they really don't understand. Um, because it's a checkbook that they, you know, they, they don't have to bounce a check. Well, communities, states, people that have to balance budgets, people, um, you know, these, these are all things where once you start putting the bill for this, I think all of us will understand what those trade-offs are. And sometimes you do it and it makes sense, and sometimes it doesn't. But um, I think the collective ignorance, and I'll throw myself in that bucket, on not only what, what it takes to get this stuff done, what it costs, what are the trade-offs, um, you know, we, the... We are all, the entire American society, are extremely ignorant on, on all of this, right? And I'm, I'm learning things today, and I, you know, I read about this stuff. Um, you know, the six to one, you know, that's, that's, these are good information. So I, I think from that standpoint, I, I think we are going to see a lot more local as local people with balanced budgets actually have to go invest in things at the expense of others. I, for, for me, uh, that problem in speaking of the electric power industry, like I, I spoke of the energy poverty, electric power poverty of the, of the global scale. If we, if we start thinking about this on a global level, I think that's what excites me about being in the industry I'm in. And bringing electric power 
uh, to parts of the world that don't have it today and the potential that could have to bring them, you know, uh, think about the refrigerator and the impact to refrigerate food in our homes um, or to have a, a washing machine in our homes, um, to have access to modern health care. And as people are, you know, liberated uh, from maybe the daily meaningful ch chores they're doing to prepare food every day, to wash their clothes, to take care of their homes, and they're, they're getting access to things like education, the potential, the brain power that we can unleash to help us solve these problems uh, and, you know, contribute to our way of life is, is pretty exciting. So I do, uh, back to the conversation we had earlier about um, rational discussions based in solid understanding of physics and science. Um, I do fear that some of the, uh, the extremes are pushing policies into parts of the world uh, that are not, that it's not the best solution for them when they have uh, access to rich, abundant natural resources and we're trying to bring them solar infrastructure where they don't yet have the grids to make that uh, a successful uh, solution. Uh, so I think coming together on that, uh, there's a lot of potential for us on a global scale and it, it's exciting to be the power industry for that. Well, first, I just want to thank the five of you for coming here to, to um, Butte America and talking to us about this. this is a great opportunity for us to hear from some experts. And uh, my question is really kind of, you know, in, at universities, we do a couple things. We educate young, bright, you know, students to be employees to go to work for your companies. And, and we talked a little bit about, like, we got to get more students in, STEM education. I think that's great. The second thing we do a lot of at universities is research. We come up with new ideas, solve problems. And so I'm wondering if you have any insight on what those innovations should be or some things that we may not be thinking about, but from industry, particularly the three of you from, or four of you from industry, um, might have to give us, you know, sparks of, of ideas to, to work on in our, in our research side of our careers at Montana Tech. Go ahead, Scott. You got any ideas? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Do I have ideas? Uh, it, my brain's pretty empty most of the time. Um, you know, I think a lot of it is, for me, is about efficiency. You know, I think that, I think the idea of, um, you know, batteries or, you know, this new technology, a lot of the stuff we talk about that are going to solve, and things don't even exist that we're talking about. We, you know, we're, we're, we're reducing one energy source to transit to something that doesn't exist. But I think a lot of that stuff is uh, kind of a fool's errand. Um, uh, you know, for society, essentially. But I think efficiency is big. You know, um, uh, you know, if you're burning fossil fuels, how, how do you make that more efficient? How do you use less to get the same thing? And I, I think these incremental improvements are really how we're going to make something big happen is by small changes over time that are thoughtful. Um, you know, I think that's a much better way to do it. Um, in terms of, like, specific ideas, um, you know, I don't really have a lot. I mean, we, we work a lot on extracting oil and gas more efficiently. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of research there. Um, you know, I'm definitely not smart enough to come up with something novel, uh, you know, <laughs> as I sit up here. But, um, but I, I think on the consumption part, I think that's where we need to get more efficient. Scott, I'd probably, I don't think that's... You just look at what Japan did uh, post uh, Fukushima and what efficiency uh, uh, leaps they made, you know, when they turned off 30% of their power generation in that country. But, you know, specific to some of your stuff, CCUS, carbon capture utilization, and sorry, you know, how do you capture carbon from uh, CO2 from flue gas? How do you do that cheaply? Some of the direct air capture technologies, I think uh, the world's got to make some advances there. Uh, high hydrogen is going to play a role. So how do you make it more affordable and cheaper to extract hydrogen? How do you put it into carbon steel pipelines so you don't get hydrogen embrittlement? Um, so I think there's lots of ways that you can embrace the energy evolution that's going on in these new technologies that are going to be going to be needed, including the the incremental stuff that uh, Sky was talking about. You know, so I think and I think that falls right into the wheelhouse of what Montana Tech can can go do. It's got material science, it's got mining applications, it's got um, you know petroleum engineering and geology, geophysics, and it's got some of those because th those are going to be tangential. Uh, technologies that are required. How do you how do you uh, quantify a methane leak out of a small little flange? You know, you don't see it. You can, it's odorless. It's colorless. You don't know. But when it leaks, that's got to be as egregious as a drop of oil falling down on the ground. And just because you can't see it and you can't 
can identify it doesn't mean it isn't leaking. So we need a lot of advances in technology around methane detection and quantification as well. So I think there's some things that, that this school is ideally set up on on the R&D side and just some of the innate capability you have here to, uh, you, you, could, you could do some things in that space. Todd, I appreciate the question. And I might add that one of the most significant breakthroughs that have had an impact on carbon emissions is the directional drilling and fracking. Uh, and the abundance of cheap natural gas has really revolutionized the electric power industry in the United States and reduced our carbon emissions by half. So go do another one of those. Yeah, I think that, uh, uh, you know, for department heads and stuff like that, if you're looking for things to do research on, go talk to the companies that are working in those fields. Because for every problem that these guys up here talked about, guys and girls, you know, there are companies that are working on it right now, and we're making tremendous progress on technology. You should never underestimate in America how fast technology knocks down barriers. And, you know, you say it may take 30 years or whatever. I'd never underestimate America. And literally everything they're talking about, there are companies that are doing it, whether it's processing rare earths, whether it's advanced in hydrogen, battery, all that stuff. It's happening. And we need to get closer as a university to companies, right? Because they're doing all this. So let's go learn from them and ask them how we can help them, which of course ultimately leads, brings money into us too, right? So I'm very positive that we're going to knock down the technical barriers through technology. And all you students are going to be a part of that. Hi. Um Yeah, just this is uh, Courtney Young. I teach in uh, metallurgical materials engineering. And obviously, you can't deliver your electricity without some sort of materials. Uh, but my question is, is, is really twofold. You, we're running out of natural resources, and so we are, we're needing to go into extreme environments for those, and so that's kind of a really broad question, more for Robin than anybody else. But, but I want your thoughts on extreme environments, but more so the other source is recycling. And technology is very complex and it makes things difficult to recycle. So what are your thoughts on design for recyclability? Um. I agree uh, with what you're saying in the sense of um, the minerals that are out there and the resources that are out there are a finite asset. And to the extent that we are able to look at the ability to achieve greater recoveries of either the existing assets or to essentially remine old assets and do the recycling side of things, that is a huge area that needs to be further investigated. I know that you're currently working on some of that as well as other people here in this um, audience. Um, and the environments that they exist in, um, whether they are in waste materials, whether they're in deep oceans, wherever they might be, is going to take um, the educated power of these individuals that I'm looking at because you're looking at um, the next 30 to 50 years, you future students in how are you actually going to get to a place where you can recover and utilize these resources um, that we are currently not able to or not um, looking at recovering as fully as we need to currently? Hey, I'm Mackenzie Alt, a master's student in industrial hygiene here at Tech. Uh, first, thank you for your gift to Montana Tech and Thanks to your family. Um, I guess my question um, is a couple of things. You spoke about needing to reduce methane emissions. So I'm wondering maybe any ways that your companies uh, are moving into like any projects into this new energy future and maybe any ways you're dealing with things like flaring when there's like safely dealing with the methane when there's maybe not a pipeline to transport it, um, so things instead of flaring, or new projects generally that your companies are undertaking 
and to improve efficiency and move toward this energy. I know there's things like um, compressed seismic in imaging that Conoco is doing, um, deep learning for natural gas, but anything you guys can specifically speak to? Well, I, I can start. Um, yes, I think, you know, we're spending a lot of time thinking about what are the technologies and things we can do inside our company. We spend probably about 300 million a year trying to think about new opportunities for the company, reduce our footprint on the emissions side. So for instance, in flaring, our company doesn't routinely flare anymore. So unless we have a gas hookup, a gas pipeline that comes to our facilities, we won't flare until we have that hookup. I think the rest of the industry needs to get to that kind of a standard. I think the U.S. can get there and will get there over time. I think the struggle is going to be, it's, it, this is a global problem. And there's a lot of uh, other countries around the world that don't have the same standards that we have in place in the United States. We're looking at seeing things like carbon capture and sequestration. We're looking at hydrogen. We're looking at some of those new technologies that could represent the, the future mix in the energy space, while at the same time trying to do our own business cheaper. And, uh, and Bob said it right, the, the unconventional revolution took the emissions intensity of our country from about 30 kilograms per barrel down to about 15 kilograms per barrel. Mm -hmm. So the shell revolution in the United States cut our emissions profile in half. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's really using natural gas to take coal out of the system mm -hmm. and then having a production source that has a lower carbon intensity than some of the other sources around. So that innovation and that combination had a dramatic effect on, uh, on what, what happens in the United States. It's allowed us to reduce our, our emissions footprint by over 26% in the last 10 years. All right. I would add something on that. Just um, you know, we're, we're talking a lot about technology and what we should be doing. Um, you know, again, the, the answer to a lot of this is money. So I think to Ryan's point, um, there are new discoveries or areas where there's not infrastructure. And in order to develop that, there needs to be an economic return, which means now the cost of doing that is more expensive because you need the infrastructure before you start to develop. So those reserves just got more expensive. And so they move further out in time. And what that means is less supply and ultimately means, you know, gasoline gets higher. So, you know, I think as we all learn of what these trade-offs are and what the impact is to the individual, I think, um, you know, people will start to have a different feeling um, as they're paying for this. You know, are you willing to pay another 15 cents to have less flaring to hopefully have you know, two tenths of a degree Fahrenheit reduction in 10 years on the globe, right? I mean, those are the types of things that we need to talk about. I'm not saying there's a right or a wrong answer there. Um, you know, I think it's where you are on the economic spectrum. I'm willing to pay it. Um, I probably wasn't when I was your age, right? And so, um, there's just a lot of the things, and I think some of the things like, why don't we recycle? We should recycle a lot more. We, we're a throwaway economy. Why don't we? Money. Um, it's not, it's not, it doesn't pay. And so, you know, these are things where the regulatory environment, the economic environment are a big part of the solution. Um, as, as Robin was saying, you know, it's a collaborative effort. You know, the money is a big, big part of it. We're a capitalist society, and we do things primarily for money. We like to think we're altruistic, but most of the things that we're done are for money. So we, we need to look at that equation, you know, make sure we're making the right trade-offs, make sure we're educating people on what those trade-offs are. And I think we do better things. I think on the flaring front, even companies like ours, and we're small, not public, under the radar, you know, we don't routine, routinely flare either. Um, and that's part of the collaboration with the people where we get our money, because um, it's important to them, and which means that a lot of times we make less money. And so you know, we're prepared to do that because of you know, that relationship, but, um, but it's a conscious decision. Yeah. All right, thank, thank you uh, so much there, Sky, and uh, the entire panel. A um, couple notes before we close out here. Um, one thing I picked up was that there's a purpose that's driving these four engineers here, and it's to serve society. You know, that's, that's one thing I picked up. Um, the other thing was to get involved. And let's, let's have some rational discussions over our energy future. And then I heard a couple times all of the above in two contexts. One, all of the above is we need to use every energy source available. But I also heard all of the above, and it's going to take every degree area at Montana Tech
to play a role in that, and they're there's uh, they're they're all going to have a seat at the table. Um, I've had the pleasure in my career to interview and hire many many engineers, and it was always my pleasure to interview and hire Montana Tech graduates because of the work ethic. And I'm reminded of what Thomas Edison said. He said many people miss opportunity because it's often wearing overalls and looks like work. But that's not a problem here at Montana Tech. So please join me in thanking our panel for a wonderful discussion. And thank you all.